welcome. Start off today, I have uh, a number of river otter picks to show you. Uh, these, uh, this was last winter. They were uh, having some fun on the frozen over pond and also having some food, uh, catching fish uh, that were still swimming around underneath the ice. Uh, chowing down, and lots of fish, very hungry otters, and definitely don't want to be bit by one of these. They have they have fish crushing teeth. Uh, they're also very social. They like to hang out in little pods um, and keep an eye on things, cuddle a bit. Helps them stay warm, probably. Um, and they also have kind of sharp uh, Nails as, as well. You probably don't want to get too close to a river otter in the water. Probably won't like that, and uh, you might you might be sad. All right. What questions do you have, Lucy? I don't know how to bring clothing to home because I just I like don't want them to run in. Yes, I will talk more about the lab out today um, in a bit. So yes, I will answer answer that question. Other questions? Okay, so if our local machine is back, we have to use these virtual boxes installed on the, the lab in the labs, right? Yeah, so the, the question is if you have uh, a Mac, uh, if you don't have Linux on your own computer, you will need to, to do the this lab two and the next lab lab three on Linux easiest uh, way would be to uh, do it on Mantis or Mirage uh, those would would work uh, you could also use a virtual machine um, like VirtualBox there are instructions for that linked from the the course webpage under under programming environment other questions. All right, so uh, we're only going to do one of these today, so I think we won't use the cards, but we will still do this question. So uh, we worked on, on absolute. Uh, this absolute difference function last time and just to review uh, the kind of key part of doing conditionals in assembly uh, we have these uh, two blank lines uh, at the start and different variations of a compare and jump or a test and jump and uh, as usual RDI has the first argument has X RSI has Y, uh, so take a minute and uh, consider which of these four pairs of instructions would would go on those blank lines. All right, so to approach this, we probably want to first determine what part of the C code these pairs of move and subtract do, so that we then know which Jumping to where corresponds to which part of the, the C code. So if we move RDI into RIX, we said that's going to put X in RIX because our first argument will be in RDI. <coughs> and then when we do sub Q RSI RIX, what will that put in RIX? We're subtracting RSI from RX and RSI is Y, so we have X minus Y. Yeah, we do destination minus source, store the result in destination. So this first pair of move and subtract is going to be our X minus Y. Um, and that means this part 
under our label L2 is going to be the y minus x. So now we can think about how do we want to jump and let's say that whatever jump we do, we don't, if we don't jump, which, uh, which of the two are we going to do, x minus y or y minus x? Yeah, x minus y, if we don't jump, we'll just continue on with the next instruction, and we know that's going to be x minus y. So we know we want to We know that if we want to do y minus x, we need to jump to L2 in order to do it. And so uh, now we can look at this compare and test. Uh, what does compare do versus what does test do? Silas? Compare is like B minus A versus test is A minus A. Yeah, so compare will do B minus A, we can uh, use the chart on the reference sheet, and there are a few extra copies here if, uh, if you need one. Uh, compare does B minus A, and it's going to let us check things such, that, such like B less than or equal to A, or B greater than A, whereas test will do bitwise and. Uh, and we'll see later in this class how that like where this test comes up, where we want to, where that is uh, going to be used instead of instead of compare. Um, so we want one of these uh, one of these two compares because our if statement is x greater than greater than y, um, and so a or a or b, which of which of these two is going to to complete our program. <coughs> Why, why are we thinking B? Um, because it it checking to see if that number is positive or if the compare number is positive or negative. Yeah, it, it looks like that would match our x greater than y, so a jump greater than. Let's consider what this compare instruction uh, is going to do. Um, we have x and y, and so jump greater than says jump when x is greater than y, b is greater than a. But if we jump, we know we're going to do y minus x. Is y minus x what we want to do when x is greater than y? No. So when the compiler took this function and put it into assembly, the if condition does not always match exactly the jump because our y minus x case is the one that we have to jump to. And so we would actually want to jump less than or equal to because then when x is less than or equal to y, that's when we want to do y minus x. That's when we want to jump to that part of the function. Does that make sense? What, uh, what questions do you have? Jay? So just to summarize, you're going to pick the jump that will take you to L2, and L2 is the else case, and so that's how you do less than equal. Exactly. That our jump needs to match the condition that we're jumping to, to implement. And there would be many, you could rearrange the assembly um, and different compilers may produce different assembly. Uh, but in this particular, and this is not uncommon that we'll see a jump to the opposite of the Boolean that appears in the C code because to just go into the if, we just want to keep going. We don't want to jump, jump over it. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. How did you know Rax was x? Like, how are you assigning the swap to the variable? So, this is something that will come up 
uh, a lot in the lab, so I will talk about it now, is when we first talked about registers, we said, okay, some of these registers have special roles. We're going to have rex be the return value. And so that's why this code puts stuff in rex, because that's what is going to hold the return value at the end of the function. So we also have registers that hold the arguments to a function. So uh, rx is not, not an argument register, uh, but we have uh, arguments one through six that can go in registers. If there are any arguments beyond six, those will need to be in memory. And the assembly code for a function that takes more than six arguments will go and get the extra arguments from memory. But we can put the first six in memory, and these will be RDI, RSI, RDX, RCX, R8, and R9. And you can use the chart of uh, registers in the reference sheet or from the notes, which has these labeled. If you would like to memorize them, there's Diane's, oops, Diane's silk dress costs $89 is a potential mnemonic. Diane's for DI, silk for SI, dress for DX, cost for RCX, and then R8 and R9. So this is how I remember the order of the six, but you can you can always just look it up. Yeah, so that's. Are these uh, arguments uh, ever uh, mutated in place during the best only code, or are those like, like off limits for any sort of uh, interaction during uh, what we call some function? Yes, so the uh, question is, can a function like do stuff to the argument registers? Um, so let me pull up a chart here. So we have this notion of caller saved registers and callee saved reg registers. And it just means that there are some registers a procedure is allowed to change, do whatever it wants with, and some that it's not allowed. And caller saved means that when I call a procedure, any of those caller saved registers, that procedure is allowed to change however it wants. And if I, the caller, need to, them to stay the same, I'm responsible for saving the value somewhere and then putting it back when I need it. And that includes, as the screen shows, the return value. Obviously, a procedure needs to be allowed to change the return value. All the argument registers and also R10 and R11. And the flip side are these uh, five callee saved registers, which means that if a procedure would change any of those five, it has to save the value, the current value, use them, and then put the current value back before it returns. 
And we'll see an example of what this actually looks like in assembly code in, in a bit. But this is a long way of answering the question, yes, the procedure is allowed to, to modify the, the argument registers. But there is a sort of designation of which registers that's allowed and which aren't. Other questions? So this was an even longer-winded way of answering the original question, how did I know that Rex was going to be x? It's that I know RDI always holds the first argument to a function. I know that my first argument to absolute diff is x, and so I know that RDI has the first argument x, and so when I move that into Rex, x goes there. So I know RSI has y, because RSI is always the second, has the second argument. All right. So, what I'd like to do now, let's do this. go. All right, here is a C function. It takes in two ints, and it sums all the ints bet between those two. So it does x plus x plus 1 plus x plus 2 up to, not including y, it returns that sum. And I submit to you that we can implement loops in assembly using nothing new from what we've already seen. That a loop is simply test some condition and then jump maybe back up to the top or maybe somewhere else. So with jumps and compare, we can do basically any kind of loop that we want. So your task is to uh, Write down the assembly for this, uh, this C function, and I will tell you which instructions you need to use, and you're going to work on assembling them into uh, the, the appropriate order. So we're going to use two add L instructions, a compare L instruction. A jump less than, a jump, and a move out. So, to clarify, this jump L is a conditional jump. It's going to, based on some uh, likely the, the compare uh, instruction will jump or not based on whether uh, B is less than A. And this JMP is an unconditional jump. It's always going to jump to uh, a particular label. So here's the basic structure of our assembly. We have the label for the start of our procedure. We have a label for the loop body. And a label for the loop test. And then a return instruction at the end. And this sort of arrangement where our body in the assembly actually shows up before the test, even though if we look at this while loop in the C code, we know that it's going to check x less than y before it goes into the loop.
this loop's going to be implemented using a kind of jump to the middle approach, where we're going to do some initialization, and then the first thing that needs to happen is the test, and then if we continue the loop, then we would go to the loop body. And so we would use these uh, six instructions, two ads, and then one of each of these, uh, to implement this, this function. I guess, yeah, not counting this return, which I told you is at the end. So uh, work with the, uh, your, your neighbors to figure out how to use these assembly instructions uh, to implement our sum x to y. All right, let's, let's uh, talk about how we put this together. So we have some initialization in the C code. We initialize the, the sum variable. Uh, which assembly instruction might be a good choice for that? And what is the return type of this function? Like in the C code, like what type of thing does it return? An A. And uh, how many, and what register would we hold an int in? Yeah, we'd hold it in some four byte register. So We, when we have a move L, that's moving four bytes, so we're going to have a, a, our four byte register names with instructions that have the, the L specified. All right. Now we have to think about what order do we want to do things? Do we, do we need to do the body? And then the test, or do we need to do the test first and then the body? Yeah, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, so if we were returning a pointer, we would just do a high x for all the eight bytes. Yes, if if we were working with longs or with pointers, things that are eight bytes, uh, we'd have move q for eight bytes, and we'd have rix as the register. So our next one is we jump to the test because we need to do the test with the body since the initial parameters could fail already. Exactly. We to implement this while loop in assembly, we know that it does the test the first time we get to the loop um, before it ever goes into the body. So we know that no matter what. After we initialize sum, we just want to go and do our test. So we would use our unconditional jump to our loop test label. So that's going to jump us down here. So now we need our test to send us back to the body or to return if the test doesn't pass. So, which assembly instructions would we use to perform this sort of branching uh, behavior? Eric? Um, compare L and L. Absolutely, a compare and a conditional jump is how we do a kind of branch, whether it's an if statement or a loop condition, whatever it is, uh, we're likely to see a compare and jump. So. Our jump less than it's a tornado testing Wednesday, <laughs> first Wednesday of every month. Um, how about our compare? What operands should our our compare instruction have to do our uh, x less than one? Yes, there. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Do EDI ESI. Is that order now? Yes. So, okay, because it's JL, would we do X first and then Y? So, 
our compare uh, will check uh, this jump less than, but this compare will say it's ESI less than EDI, which in this case is saying Y less than X. So I, th I, think that, I think we do need to put these in the other order, because our, our jump less than is going to do B less than A, and in that, that's the case when it would jump to the loop by. Um, so do we do we need to use these ESI uh, these thirty two bit registers? Uh, it's a fair point that the higher four bytes are going to be zero in both case and uh, in, in, in for both of these. But when we have a, an L instruction, we'll always see registers of the corresponding size. So we wouldn't see compare L and then used with um, values in 8-byte registers, though um, if we did do that comparison, it would have the same outcome. Yeah, Chris? So if we did compare Q and then the other um, registers, it would just be less efficient? Um, so I don't think there would be any efficiency difference uh, between the 4-byte and the 8-byte version. It's simply the case that this C code is working with four byte integers. And so the assembly that will be produced will be dealing with four byte quantities. Uh, but it would be equivalent in this case to, to use the eight byte registers. We just wouldn't, the compiler would, would not do that. John? Is there a case where it wouldn't be equivalent? Like, is there a reason that the compiler is always using these? Quantities, uh, um, question is, uh, is there a case where it wouldn't be equivalent? Um, I am 100% certain one could construct such a case um, with, uh, it might be sort of contrived to get some weird stuff in the higher order bits of these registers, um, and, and in that case it would matter. Uh, and by process of elimination, we have our, our add instructions going going to the loop by size. Is there any reason that they did the horrible ordering of compares have go B, A, and then we're compare them in the opposite direction? Um, uh, you, you'll, you have to like, get, get, get... Every time, it's, you think the opposite, that's not. Uh, you have to get in a time machine and, and go yell at Intel engineers in the 1970s. Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, it does, like the, the subtraction that it's performing to set the condition codes matches the way the subtract instruction works. So there's some kind of consistency there. Um, but I will readily acknowledge uh, x86 assembly not optimized for readability. <laughs> Sad to say. So we have our two add L instructions inside the loop body. Uh, can someone give us the, the two that, that you're thinking should go there? Okay. We want to add X to sum, and so in this case, X is uh, EDI, and so that's going to go first. Um, and then we're adding that to sum, which is EAX, and that is the value stored. So that looks good to me. How about the other? Yeah, John. Uh, just adding uh, one to uh, two F, so add literal one to EDI. All right, and this function, initialize, we jump to our test, and then we repeatedly compare x and y, and either jump back up, do the loop body, go to the test again, or if we have a conditional jump and we don't jump, we just go to the next instruction 
uh, and the assembly loops, which in this case, we're done with our loop and all that's left to do uh, is return. Sam? Would it also work if you just um, had the loop body after your return statement and then had your jump, um, your jump at the end of uh, e at the end of the loop body? Um, yes, yeah, so the, the question is could we rearrange this to have the test first? where we initialize, we do the test, and if we don't do the test, we need to jump past the body to return, and then at the end of the body, we always jump back up to the test. This would require slightly more instructions. Um, no, but like, if you just, um, at the end of the test, you return if you're not jumping to the body, so the body's out of the return Or is that not people? Oh, yeah. So if we put the body down here, and this would jump down to the body past the return? And then you just put the jump from the test um, at the end of the body. Yeah, so I think that that would be, um, that would be a, a reasonable way to, to implement this in assembly. I think that it would, um, and yeah, it's, it's not uncommon to see code after a return and we either jump past the return or we're going to return. Christian? Um, how does our assembly node return an EAX and not RAX or something like that? So, the so use... The rest was not initialized or...? So, the uh, way return... So, like, the return instruction set itself does not do anything with the return value. It's not like the return we're used to seeing in C or Java or Python, which both ends a function and sets a return value. All the write instruction does is end the function. And it goes back to wherever it was called. And then the code there will use or not whatever is in RAX or EAX. So the calling function will just pick. Yeah, the calling function will use what ha happens to be in uh, what the what the function has put in RAX or, or EAX. Okay. So, so in assembly, the return is more akin to like a break uh, in C plus plus or C than like an, an actual return. Yeah. Well, we will get into the nitty gritty details of precisely what the return instruction does, um, and it's. Uh, but yeah, it's it's something like an unconditional jump, which something is something like a, a break that just like sends you to some other place in the code. Other questions? All right. Uh, a few things that I'd like to play around with in um, uh, not this, there we go, in uh, our um, compiler explorer. So we have uh, GCC producing um, uh, code uh, like what we, what we came up with for our, our sum x to y function. Uh, it has these kind of placeholder labels, L3 and L2, doesn't Name, give them nice names like loop body and loop test. Uh, I also I wanted to demonstrate that the assembly a compiler produces uh, depends on how we t how we tell the compiler to optimize uh, the produced assembly, and that's this dash capital O uh, in the command line. You would provide that to the the GCC command to tell it how much to optimize. So. Uh, G just says minimal optimizations. Uh, if we do dash O1, that uh, does, I have, there are levels one, two, and three. So I have uh, one is the, the first level optimization. Um, and here we, uh, it's set up to, the, the compiler has uh, arranged it so that we have, do a test first and then jump past uh, everything and otherwise move into uh, into the test uh, here. And it's also um, used a jump not equal to instead of a jump 
less than, as it's determined that we're adding one to x, uh, and uh, for us to get there, x must have been less than y, and so we're going to jump once they're, once they're uh, oh, we're going to return once they're equal. Uh, but this is still pretty similar to uh, the assembly at the lower optimization level. If we go up to optimization level two, we see that the <coughs> compiler, instead of moving zero, has used XOR, a value with itself, which will set it to all zeros. Uh, there's, uh, because our bitwise operations like XOR have dedicated circuits within the hardware, uh, if we can use XOR instead of a, a move, uh, might be a little, a little more efficient. Um, but things get really strange once we go to optimization level three. I should say I have tested uh, this um, uh, timing-wise, and these optimization levels G1 and 2 are very similar in terms of the, the running time. Uh, but optimization level three is much faster and much stranger. <laughs> so uh, it uses an extension of uh, x86, um, which will not be a focus in this course. I just want to mention it now. It's SSE is the name of this extension. Stands for streaming SIMD extensions, where SIMD is single instruction multiple data. Basically, these extensions have added bigger, and there's a number of versions of them, they've added bigger and bigger registers. So there's these um, XXM registers are 128 bits, uh, there's 256 bit registers, there's 512 bit registers, and there's a bunch of instructions that basically operate as if the registers are a list of values and kind of do an operation on each kind of pairwise byte within the registers, and so if you're performing uh, the same operation on the same data over and over, these sort of vector-like uh, instructions in practice uh, can be a lot faster. And so I won't pretend to understand every detail of these SSE instructions, but uh, the compiler is not wrong that this version uh, is considerably faster than the other version uh, because of how this uh, extended version of, of x86 performs. So uh, for this course, you're not expected to uh, uh, understand the, these SSE instructions or what this is all, all doing. Just wanted to, to mention that this, this does exist. Yeah, Did you say this was faster than like the previous like six, seven lines? And it is, yes. To my great, to, to, to my surprise as well, um, the, uh, these um, uh, single instruction, multiple data in, in instructions, uh, there's the way that they are executed in the CPU, uh, the, the architecture might be set up to parallelize these in a way that it doesn't. Uh, our, our other instructions um, is one is one possibility, uh, but yes, it is it is considerably faster. Silas, will we in this class or are there any other classes at Carlton that go into exactly how we get from the assembly code to the stuff that computers actually do? Um, so that's uh, that's a good question. How do we get from assembly code to what the the CPU is actually doing? Um, the distance is perhaps not as far as you might think. So um, if we go back to our, our simpler version, um, I can uncomment this, this main method, uh, which just calls our sum to x, zero 
with 0 and 10 uh, and prints out the return value. Uh, and I can see my main, uh, main function. I move 10 into ESI and 0 into EDI. And EDI, ESI are first two arguments to a function. And so this is what we would expect to see before a call to a function is move or, or similar instructions to set up the arguments in uh, the appropriate registers. And uh, we then see before the call to printf, we have to set up the arguments for that as well, ESI and EDI. Our second argument is the return value from some x to y. So we take EAX, which has that return value. And EDI has this label, LCO, which is just this string constant percent D. So this, if we compile this and look at what this works, what's being moved in EDI is just a memory address, just the address in memory where that string of uh, that array of characters that has percent D, where that is stored in memory. Some other points about this kind of compiled to, to binary view is uh, each of these instructions is stored at a particular address. So this move instruction is stored at address in hex 401126. And then the next jump instruction is stored uh, 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 kind of slightly higher up in memory from that, and, and this add instruction uh, above that, and so on. And above each of these instructions are the actual bytes that are stored in memory, the encoding of this assembly instruction into ones and zeros, into machine code. So our move zero into a EAX is, takes five bytes and is B8 followed by four bytes of zeros. Our jump instruction is interesting. It is EB and then zero five. But what we see here is that what follows our, our jump is, what is displayed here anyway, is another memory address, 40132. And we can see that that is the address of our compare instruction. So this jump says, okay, jump to the address of the compare instruction. <coughs> but if we look at the bytes, that are actually in memory, we don't see this address, 401132. We see 05. And this is, uh, or this comes from the fact that we have a special register that I haven't told you about. <laughs> Percent RIP, <laughs> which uh, does not stand for rest in peace. <laughs> Rip job. Which the IP is for instruction pointer. And this is the, this register holds. instructions, what they're actually doing is just changing the value in our instruction pointer, just changing which address we're going to execute instruction from next. Vincente? Um, for the to add functions, mm -hmm. is there a reason, or I guess like, how does it know how to add things? So in the bits like below it, there's nothing pointing to like an add function? Or? Um, 
So are, are you talking about the fact that this add instruction is 0, 1, F8? Another one is, oh, is the one, sorry, is that the one above it, or? Yeah, so, okay. so each instruction, the bytes in memory are shown above it. Oh, gotcha, okay. But there's, I mean, there's nothing in common between the two add functions. No, there isn't an O1. Oh, I said. Yeah, so, so what the CPU is actually doing uh, is the instruction pointer has an address in memory, goes to that address in memory, and read by, reads bytes from there. And all our different instructions have some binary encoding, some sequence of ones and zeros that mean, okay, add, and then uh, the literal value one or the register edx or whatever it is. And so the CPU is reading in these bits and interpreting them as a particular instruction. And so for our purposes, uh, we generally don't have to um, like, in most cases, we don't have to think about, okay, what is the specific encoding for an add, inst like, how do we put add the add instruction into binary versus a subtract instruction or, or whatever. Um, for uh, uh, lab three, we will actually have to think about that uh, a bit um, because we'll be uh, uh, mounting a, a, an attack on a vulnerable program. So we'll need to be taking, uh, we'll, we'll have to think very carefully about memory in order to, to exploit that, that vulnerability. Um, but the, 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 just to finish the point about the jump, what this 05 says is that's how much to add to the instruction pointer when you do this jump. So normally the instruction pointer, when we get to the jump, it's going to be the next instruction. It's going to be this add instruction. Because normally when we get to instruction, we're just, the next thing we're going to do is the one right after it. So we normally have 40112D, that would be the instruction pointer. And then this jump says add 5 to the instruction pointer. And if we add 5 to D, to 2D, we get 32. And so this, and so when we're looking at this, uh, this uh, box that I checked compiled to binary, without that, we are just taking the C code to assembly and stopping there. When I check this box, we take the C code to assembly to machine code and then decompile the machine code back to assembly, which is how we get to see the actual bytes that are stored in memory when we compile it. And so this says add five to the current value of the instruction pointer, which would just move it to uh, this address. And so that's why the, the tool that is decompiling it is doing that math for us and showing us the address that this jump will, will send the program to. What are your questions on this? All right, so a little short on time, and I want to make sure to talk about the lab, so uh, I will get right to that. All right. So there's more practice and um, uh, uh, detail in the, the notes posted for today. Um, talked about the, the register uses, so let's talk about how to get started on lab two. So, go to CS208, labs, lab two. So I explained in class the other day, everyone's going to get a, uh, a uniquely generated, already compiled program, a bomb. And uh, your job is to figure out what input to give to the bomb that will diffuse the, the different phases within it. So to get started, you go to this address, you put in your username and your email and submit. And something will. What? I don't think it's legal to get bombs. Uh, these these are, are totally legal bombs. I checked. <laughs> Very super legal. Um, all right. So if something pops up. You download a bomb. Some number. Dot tar. They're all different. So 
that's why they're they're numbered. And I'm on a Mac, so the bomb's not gonna, going to work. I need to be on Linux. So I want to connect to Mantis. And then I will open a folder once it finishes loading. Documents, CS208, fall 21. Open the folder. Something neat that I can do is I have this bomb5.tar. It's on my local computer. It's not on <coughs> Mantis but I can just drag it over to the files in Mantis and it will upload it. So now on Mantis, I can extract my bomb five. It has some files, it has bomb.c, which has uh, an important uh, a message. And uh, bomb.c is just showing you the main method of the C code. So it's showing you that uh, it's going to initialize the bomb, and then it's going to get a line of input and then call phase one. Then get a line of input and call phase two. And so these functions, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five, phase five and phase six, are the kind of six different pieces you need to diffuse um, as part of the lab. So, uh, there are kind of two, of the, 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 the write-up describes this uh, in, um, as well. There are two ways to approach the lab. So the phases are worth different amounts of points. And one way to get 60 out of 60 is to diffuse all six phases. And this is what I would call the hacking approach to the lab. Your goal is not to fully understand the assembly code for each of these. It's to uh, understand just enough to figure out what the diffusing input is. To focus on, all right, how do I avoid exploding the bomb? What does that require? And to get through all six phases. You can also earn points for submitting a description of phases that you have diffused. And so the other, I would call analyzing way of approaching the lab is to diffuse the first four out of the six phases and then submit descriptions for two of the ones you diffused. And so this is, you're focusing more on actually understanding completely what two particular phases are doing such that you can describe what the phase, uh, what the phase is. And there's more detail about what goes into these descriptions in the lab write-up. So the key tool for doing this lab uh, is the GNU debugger. GNU debugger or GDB. And so I can uh, start GDB uh, with my, so I guess first I can just run the bomb. Nope, I need to CD into bomb five and then I can run the bomb. Welcome to my fiendish little bomb. You have six phases with which to blow yourself up. Have a nice day. What's going on? And I blew the bomb up. And uh, if I go to the this address slash progress, I can see bomb five, I've exploded it once. There's no penalty associated with exploding the bomb, at least I asked at the beginning, but they are they are tracked, I will know. <laughs> uh, so I have to figure out, okay, what is actually going on in this bomb? So GDB is a tool that gives me this kind of command line interface uh, to, um, to uh, kind of uh, helping to debug or, or analyze a program. And there is a number of resources about GDB linked from the course webpage, including a, an introductory video. Uh, so you, uh, I expect you to, to use those to, to learn the parts of, of GDB um, that we need. But to demonstrate a few things, um, the, the, one of the crucial things is to have the program stop when it reaches a particular point. Uh, and this is called a breakpoint. 
we want to like get to some part of the program and stop there, you know, before we explode the bomb, ideally. So I know that there's a function called phase one that is the first phase. So I could say break phase one, and it has set this breakpoint at this address, which is the address of the first instruction in the phase one function. So now if I run, uh, uh, run the program, I see the same printout. I put in some input, and now the program has stopped at the start of phase one. And I can run a disassemble command to show me the assembly instructions inside phase one with a little arrow showing me which instruction I'm on. So uh, number of things that I want to call your attention to. The first is we are subtracting eight from RSP and adding eight to RSP right before we return. This is something you will see in most functions. RSP, if you remember, is our stack pointer. It's keeping track of the stack region of memory. And we will talk in detail about why we do this adding and subtracting. But for now, this adding and subtracting is not going to be relevant to diffusing the bomb. And this gets to a, a larger point about this lab. Whether you're doing the kind of going the hacking route or the analyzing route, a big part of this lab is working on the skill of isolating the important details and ignoring everything else. So this add and subtract RSP, that's one of the everything else that we want to ignore to focus on our mission, which is not calling the explode bomb function. That's what we don't want to happen. So we want, we want this function to return without calling explode bomb. We also see a call to a function called strings not equal. Mr. Doctor the Professor is not truly evil. The strings not equal function checks if strings are not equal. That's what it does. If there's a function called read six numbers, it's reading six numbers from somewhere. I want to show you... Um, if I look at the assembly for main, which is, which is long, I want to note that sometimes you'll see functions that say at PLT. That means they are a C library function. And you should go to c++.com or another C programming reference to look up the fopen function or the puts function. Um, or you might see kind of other things like printf, um, if we look at the assembly for, I mentioned there is a read six numbers function that comes up later. There is a call to this weirdness, this ISOC 99 scanf. This scanf part is the C library function. It's a way of taking a string and parsing out different pieces of it. And so for this, you'll want to uh, post on the form or look up documentation about scanf uh, to figure out what that's doing. But back to our, not does this, uh, back to our phase one, I can do uh, the command step i to step one instruction forward in the assembly. So now I see that my little arrow says I'm on the second instruction here. And I can step I again and see I've moved on to this third instruction. Now if all we could do is step one, one instruction at a time, that wouldn't be super useful. But the other critical thing we can do in GDB is print out things that are in registers and examine values that are in memory. So I can say P for print percent ESI, except it's not percent, it's dollar sign ESI. When we want to refer to a register in a GDB command, this is sort of infuriating to me, but if I try to percent print the name of the register with percent, it's a syntax error, so I need to put dollar signs in front of the register names in GDB commands. Um, Eric? Are all these command lines, the GDB command lines, named in right? 
Um, yes, where would we find out about GDB commands? Um, the lab links to uh, resources uh, here. There are a number, of, there's a cheat sheet of commands and various tutorials um, linked here from the course webpage. Um, so the last thing that I want to, to show you, we could print out this ESI, and that just tells us the value that's stored in ESI. But if ESI is a pointer, which I think it might be, I can use X to say, okay, treat this as a pointer and go tell me what's in memory there. So it prints out some stuff. And if I, I can also tell both print and S what, how to interpret the values in memory there. So if I say slash S, that says interpret what's at that address as a string. And I'm seeing there's a string there and back again, period, living in memory somewhere. I wonder if that might be relevant to defase, diffusing uh, this phase. All right. Here I promised we'd see what test is useful for. If we test something, we and it, and it usually see test something with itself. If we and two things together, we can then jump uh, if they're not equal, which means that the result was not zero. So testing something with itself is usually a way of checking if something is zero, rather than moving zero into some register and then doing a compare. So if you see test with a register with itself, it's part of something checking if, if that register is zero. All right. We'll have lots of time for questions on this and more on assembly, but that'll do it for today. Uh, I have, as I wrote on the board and then didn't say, office hours 4.30 to 5 in my office, and then at 5 I will go to the CS ice cream social um, outside CMC, and you can find me there. Thank you. Thanks,